Hello, and welcome to the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. I'm your host, Benjamin Douglas, and this is the show where each week I read a chapter from a different indie author. Thanks for joining me for today's reading. Hi, thanks for joining me today for episode number nine of the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. I'm very excited uh, today. I'm reading from indie author and co-host of the science fiction and fantasy marketing podcast, Mr. Jeffrey Poole. Yeah, but before we do that, let me just say, hey, this is the last episode in the single digits. Next week, kind of a milestone for me, my 10th episode in my first ever podcast. So join me next week. It's going to be an exciting show, surprise author I'm reading from. Um, We're just going to have a lot of fun. But back to today. (laughs) So Jeffrey Poole, who, like his uh, co-host of that podcast, Mr. Joseph Lalo, I discovered through the podcast that they host. So again, just a little further evidence that You know, doing these things like hosting podcasts, even if your primary audience is other authors, is still building platform because in addition to an aspiring author, I'm a reader and I might not have encountered Jeffrey's work if it hadn't been for that podcast. So um, kudos to you as well, Jeffrey, for building platform, giving us content with value. I'm going to go ahead and read Jeffrey's Amazon author bio. Jeffrey M. Poole is a professional author living in sunny Lake Havasu City, Arizona, with his wife, Jillian, and their Welsh corgi, Keeley. Jeffrey is the best-selling author of fantasy series Bakian Chronicles and Tales of Lentari, along with mystery series Corgi Case Files. Jeffrey's interests include astronomy, archaeology, archery, scuba diving, collecting movies, and tinkering with any electronic gadget he can get his hands on. In March 2015, Jeffrey became a proud member of SFWA, the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. Fans can follow Jeffrey online at his blog, www.authorjmpool.com. All right, so there's Jeffrey's Amazon author bio. As always, just a reminder, I'll be dropping Jeffrey's uh, website, a link to his website, and a link to his Amazon author page here in the show notes at http colon slash slash thebookspeakspodcast.wordpress.com if you want to check all that out. All right. So, Jeffrey um, has these two long-running fantasy series, The Tales of Lentari, from which we're reading today, and The Bakian Chronicles. He also has these, I think, are they cozy mysteries, Jeffrey? I'm not sure. I haven't read them. I apologize. The Corgi Case Files. Just from the branding, they look like cozy mysteries. They look super cute. I've heard you talk about them a little bit on the podcast. Um but I don't remember much in detail. But if you're interested at all in mysteries, cozy mysteries, or mysteries with dogs, <laughs> check out Jeffrey Poole's Corgi Case Files. Hey, who doesn't love a corgi? They're so derpy, am I right? Yeah, super cute. Good, um, but the, the book from which we're reading today, the first in series for the Tales of Lentari, features a short prologue. So I'll be reading that prologue, followed by about half of chapter one so that we have a decent sized reading. And I want to say thank you to Jeffrey for giving me permission to do that on the show. Thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate it. Jeffrey also has a feature in the Permafree boxed set Quest, which I've mentioned before on the show in Patty Jansen's episode. Um, So check that out. You can find that again through his Amazon author website. It's a free boxed set including a title by Jeffrey Poole, and those are all fantasy stories. You know, in Jeff's bio, he touches on these various hobbies he has that, on the face of it, don't sound related to writing. Archery, scuba diving, archaeology, right? 
But I, as I've said many times, listen to this podcast he co-hosts, and I've actually heard him talk about how some of these hobbies inform his writing. If you have a character who's an archer, it makes a lot of sense to have some experience in archery, for example. So here's the big thought for the day, a question to any listeners who'd care to respond. What are some life experiences or hobbies or professional experiences you have had or specifically pursued for this purpose that have had an impact or an influence on your writing? Now, I know that's a loaded question because, of course, everything in life influences the art we create. <laughs> I realize that. But I mean, like, specifically, like, you know, oh, yeah, I, uh, I played in a band for 20 years. And uh, so when I wrote this urban fantasy, I really had a lot to say about the character who's a guitarist in the bar band or something like that. If you want to drop a comment on the web page, the show notes, you're absolutely welcome to do that. I'll respond. I want to remind everyone that the show is on iTunes. Any ratings or reviews are really appreciated. Super, super appreciated. You can also subscribe to the Book Speaks podcast on the webpage, thebookspeakspodcast.wordpress.com. And lastly, I want to remind everyone that the reading you're about to hear from Jeffrey Poole's The Lost City, Volume 1 of The Tales of Lentari, does not come from an official audio book. This is merely my reading done for this show, promotional material for Jeff, and a fun experience for me, <laughs> and I hope, I hope a fun experience for you as well. I think I'm experiencing a little more background noise today. I don't know if there's construction outside or something, but I apologize for that if it bothers you. Hopefully it's not too noticeable, and I hope you enjoy the reading. Please do come back next week for episode number 10, it's going to be a hoot. All right, without any further ado, here we go. Lost City. Tales of Lentari, Book One, by Geoffrey Poole. Prologue. Sticking close to his father's side, the young dwarf peered with undisguised wonder at the workshop before them. Row after row of sledgehammers, swages, fullers, chisels, punches, drifts, and tongs hung from hundreds of pegs. Work tables, shelves of tools, and stacks of molds were everywhere. Lined up against the far wall were four gigantic anvils. The boy swallowed nervously. This was nothing like his father's foundry. Who ever heard of a workshop having more than one anvil, let alone four? His father's anvil was tiny compared to these. Then again, his father made axe handles. His area of expertise didn't require that large of an anvil. In fact, it didn't really require an anvil at all. And that was the reason why they were here. Intent on inspecting the huge anvils up close, the dwarf child broke away from the group and moved towards the back wall. A heavy, calloused hand suddenly dropped on his shoulder and spun him about until he was facing the rest of the group. Two black eyes peered suspiciously at him from behind a worn leather helmet. Master Melnar will be teaching us the nuances of working with silver, gold, and other precious metals, his father quietly told him. If I can see for myself what techniques he uses when working with silver and what tools he uses, then I might one day be able to sell something besides axe handles. Do not even think about wandering off. If you cause me to miss the part on smithing silver, you won't be able to sit for a month. Do you catch my meaning? But you told me you know his son the boy accused. 
You and Uncle fought side by side together with Breslin. Does that not mean they owe you a favor? His father sighed heavily. I want no special recognition. This is a skill I will learn on my own. If you say so, father. Roll your eyes at me again, and I'll smack them right out of your head. The boy cringed. His defiant expression quickly vanished. After what felt like hours, the boy watched as the famous keymaker finally reached under one of his tables and plunked down two metal bars. One was gold, the other silver. Malnar then retrieved several sets of tongs, both large and small, from one of the shelves nearest to him, and then unfurled a long strip of dark blue fabric across the table. Lined up in a row of pockets was a set of small hammers with heads of various shapes and sizes. He slowly walked the length of the table and pointed at various hammers, explaining that the plethora of sizes was for shaping the malleable and ductile metals into different contortions. Disinterested, the boy again decided to inspect the far recesses of the workshop. As he slowly edged away from his father, he once again headed toward the row of anvils, when a commotion drew everyone's attention. Two of the smaller underlings, evidently brothers from the way they were laying into one another, had started brawling. Over and over they rolled around the floor, arms wrapped around the other, as each tried to pin his opponent to the ground. The boy watched as his father and several adults tried to separate the two brothers. The distraction was all he needed to slip quietly away to admire the workshop's many features at his own leisure. While everyone focused on separating the two fighters, the child walked around the closest anvil and silently noted its dimensions. He was aware of the quarrel behind him, but he continued to ignore it. The workshop and all its fascinating treasures were what demanded his attention. Someday he hoped to have a workshop as impressive as the one he was in now. As such, he decided to try and mentally tabulate everything he could see. Lucas tried to catalog the various tools on the walls, but there were just too many tongs and hammers. Wouldn't it be great if someday his own workshop had so many tools that even he didn't know how many... Something slammed into him and threw him off balance. It was one of the brawlers, having been shoved across the room by his brother. Off balance, eyes open wide with fright, the young dwarf flailed his arms in an attempt to avoid tipping over backwards. Directly behind him was the red-hot furnace, and there was nothing to arrest his fall. Chapter 1 A Burn or Not a Burn Metallic clangs echoed noisily off the stone walls as an adult dwarf hammered mercilessly on a long, thin strip of metal. Rotating the metal rod so that the flattened side was now facing up, the hammering began anew. 
On and on the dwarf pounded away on the anvil. Hefting the heavy black hammer easily, the dwarf paused to wipe his forearm along his sweaty brow. Giving the strip of metal an angry scowl and a rather fierce shake, the hammering began again. A young dwarf child appeared in the shopkeeper's doorway, arms laden with scrolls and books. Depositing the load on a table already covered with metal shavings, small hammers, and several tiny files, the child quietly watched as his father continued to pound the same piece of metal over and over. After waiting a few moments, the child cleared his throat. The relentless clanging finally ceased. Is it finished? Silence. How does it look? Terrible. May I see it? No. There's nothing worth looking at. I've already melted it back down. Didn't you say you'd get a second opinion before any drastic action was taken? Trust me. It was terrible. Still having trouble with the hammers? Really? What gave you that idea? The child stooped to pick up several small hammers that were on the floor. I doubt these fell off the table of their own accord, the boy thoughtfully observed, ignoring his father's sarcasm. Only the hammers found their way to the floor. No tongs, no files, and no scraps. Therefore, I would deduce that you might be having difficulty with the... I already know what I'm having difficulty with, Vank snapped, twisting around to grab one of the diminutive hammers. He gestured angrily at his son. Look at this thing. My hand is too big to wield this properly. What type of hammer is that? Lucas, I know you know what type it is, Vank said in exasperation. I do not need you to test me to see whether or not I know their nature. Father, is this hammer for planishing, embossing, raising, or riveting? Sighing, Vank took the tool and felt the hammer's head. The hammer was two-sided. One head was flat, and the other was domed. Raising. Lucas looked down at the hammers he was holding, and selected one with two flat surfaces, one smaller than the other. He held it out to his father. This one is a raising hammer. That one is an embossing hammer. Vank studied the two hammers. The one with the rounded end is for embossing? Aye. The raising hammer should be used first to get the silver into the shape you want it to be. The embossing hammer is used to smooth the surface. That explains all the blemishes. Wizards be damned. When did you become an expert on silversmithing? When I read the books that Master Melnar recommended. All of them. Books are for scholars. You learn by getting your hands dirty. Lucas smiled. After six months, one would think your hands would be dirty enough. Do not start sounding like Athos, his father ordered. Changing the subject, Lucas gestured towards the table. I have the information you requested from the archives. 
Master Argon agreed to loan us everything you wanted, provided you show him how the axe turns out. Vank turned towards the table and started rifling through the documents. I cannot fathom who in their right mind would want a troll skull on an axe. Wait, what is all this? Lucas, what have you brought? I asked for pictures. There's nothing but writing here. How am I supposed to fashion a troll skull unless I have a picture? Read the descriptions, Father. Everything you need to know is there. What I need to know is what a troll skull looks like. Lucas raised his eyes up off the document he was reading and settled them on his father. You said you fought dozens of trolls with uncle. How is it you do not know what their skulls look like? A troll is not a creature that had to be cleaned like a fish, Venk argued, tucking a stray wisp of his black beard into his belt. Those cursed fiends ambushed us while we were looking for the human prince. I had no time to inspect them up close when another troll was preparing to bite my face off. So you must have noticed how many teeth they had, how big their fangs were, how wide their mouths could... Lucas! Venk sighed heavily. I was too preoccupied to notice, and even if I did, I certainly would not remember. Help me. Find a suitable description in that mess which tells me how to make this accursed skull. Yes, father. Five hours later, Venk was painstakingly smoothing out the blemishes on an elongated object the size of his son's clenched fist. It was a silver troll skull, ready to be attached to the axe handle he had completed last month. Venk beamed. This was one of his better attempts. His customer should be pleased. The original order called for a dragon skull to be on the other side of the axe, but Vank had flatly refused. Due to recent events, his attitude towards dragons had completely changed. He had told the customer that he wouldn't dare dishonor a dragon by putting it and a troll on the same weapon. The client had finally relented, agreeing the axe would be just fine with only the troll skull on one side. The dome of the skull shone with a mirrored finish. Two eye sockets gleamed evilly back at him. Four fangs, two upper and two lower, protruded from the closed jaws. Grabbing the cloth he had been using to buff the silver, he applied another coat of rubbing compound to the skull and admired how the many blows from the tiny embossing hammer had practically disappeared. Perhaps Lucas was right, and he should reconsider his decision to not read the books that Master Melnar had suggested to him. What's that? His son's voice snapped him out of his reverie. Hmm? His son pointed at the silver object he was holding. What is that? Lucas repeated, frowning at the object. Vank proudly offered the silver skull to his son for his approval. That, my boy, is a silver troll skull, just like the customer wanted. 
confused, Lucas looked up at his father. What were you reading? Eh? What do you mean? Father, what were you reading? What's the problem? Vank gruffly asked, annoyed that his son wasn't beaming with pride. The troll skull is inaccurate, father. Next you'll tell me dragons don't spit fire. Lucas ran his finger along the top of the troll's cranium. An adult troll has a bony ridge running the length of the skull, starting at the base of the neck and ending halfway down the forehead. This skull doesn't have that ridge. Unless the customer wants an infant troll skull, I would fix this. How do you know that? Lucas sighed and rolled his eyes. I read it from the same book I gave to you. The child walked deliberately over to the table and reached for the open book. Now wait just a moment. Venk hurried over to the small work table and yanked the book out of his son's grasp. He gestured angrily at the page on the right. Nowhere does it state that the skull has a ridge. Lucas pulled the book down lower so that he could see the descriptions for himself. With his father still holding the book, Lucas glanced down at the aforementioned paragraph. There is no mention of a cranial ridge in that passage, Lucas admitted. The problem is... Vank smiled. Ha! Thought as much. The problem is... Lucas continued, ignoring his father's outburst. This passage refers to an infant troll. The description of the adult skull is on the opposite page. Vank's angry eyes jumped from the right page to the left. Well, I'll be a son of a... Sure enough, the description of the adult's skull was there along with the mention of the infernal cranial ridge his son had reminded him about. Lucas noticed his father's darkening mood, and hastily pointed back at the small furnace. It shouldn't be too difficult to fashion a cranial ridge out of more silver, if you have some left in the smelter. With a scowl, Vank donned his thick leather gloves and pulled out the tiny pot of molten silver. His son was right, of course. It shouldn't be too difficult to add a line of silver to... Turning too quickly, Vank stubbed his toe on the closest table leg and lurched forward, smashing his knee into a stool. Since working with molten metal would undoubtedly set any wooden furniture ablaze. All of his shop's furniture was solid metal. His knee throbbed mercilessly. Vank hurriedly set the iron pot down on his workbench before any of the molten silver could spill out. Unfortunately, a tiny drop splashed out of the pot and arced gracefully through the air. It landed high on his son's right shoulder, causing him to cry out in pain. One week later, Vank and his sons were standing patiently in the home of the clan's healer. Lucas's burn had refused to heal 
despite having numerous salves and bits of herbs applied to it. In fact, the wound had become infected in only a matter of days, thus forcing the desperate parents to seek out the services of the healer. The last thing either of the parents wanted was their son's secret deformity becoming known. Hands jammed deep in his pockets, Vank softly scowled. If Lucas had not accompanied him that fateful day almost seven months ago, he wouldn't be in this dilemma. Vank sighed. Lucas was a very bright child, and was naturally inquisitive about a great many things. So, when his son had learned Melnar was not only offering tours of his famous workshop in Borag, but also lessons in rudimentary metalsmithing, he convinced his father to not only sign up, but to also allow him to tag along. The seminar had been going well. That is, until those two misbehaving Kelpa knocked his son into the forge. Lucas claimed he hadn't been burned, yet the large disfiguring mark covering most of his back said otherwise. Vank had hoped that his son's back would heal and the mark would fade away, but alas, it had not. As a result, he had to instruct his son to keep his shirt on at all times. Not that he had too much to worry about. Dwarf children, and adults for that matter, rarely took their shirts off in public. Now, however, his son had been burned by his carelessness. The healer was going to want to inspect the wound up close, and in order to do that, Lucas would have to remove his shirt. How was he going to explain the existence of the large mark covering his son's back? Vank twisted his beard so much that it began to resemble a knotted rope. Vank, young Master Lucas, what seems to be the problem today? Vank's head snapped up. Master Paradol had finally appeared. Tiny and withered, the gray-bearded healer approached the two of them and eyed them speculatively, no doubt trying to determine why they required his services. He's got a burn on his shoulder. Does he now? Very well. Come with me. Master Paradal turned to walk into his study. Father and son followed silently. Sit there, Paradal instructed Lucas. Remove your shirt and we will have a look. Lucas hopped up on the bare wood stool and pulled his tunic over his head. Paradol peeled back the bandage on the boy's right shoulder and gently prodded the wound, noting that the burn had indeed become infected. Catching sight of what appeared to be gray blobs on the underling's back, Paradol slowly walked around the stool. The healer's eyes widened with surprise as he observed a large disfiguration on the boy's skin that looked as though a mass of tiny, fluffy clouds had descended from topside and taken up residence on Lucas's back. The large gray mark stretched from the base of Lucas's neck to just above his waist. Questioningly, Paradol turned to the boy's father. 
It's a burn he received months ago, Vank explained. It never festered, and from what my son tells me, he was never in any pain. Yet it failed to heal properly, Peridol observed. Aye. The healer poked the boy's back in several random spots. Do you feel any pain? Lucas shook his head. No. Peridol looked at the boy's father, surprise evidently on his face. It's a tattoo! My son does not have a tattoo. He was pushed into a furnace and the mark appeared as a result. End of story. A corner of the boy's back caught the healer's eye. Peridol dropped down on one knee to inspect the lower left corner of the tattoo. A section the size of a large pebble had caught his eye. It was darker than the rest of the mark and stood out like a sore thumb. This looks like a hammer. Venk nodded. I've seen it. It's not any style of hammer I'm familiar with. My son got the burn on Master Melnar's forge. I figure the surface of the furnace must have had that hammer on it somewhere. I would still argue that the mark has been tattooed on young Lucas's back, Peridol told Venk, running his fingertips along the surface of the hammer. Only the boy's unbroken skin could be felt. No scars, no damaged tissue, not even so much as a wrinkle could be detected. Very peculiar. Well, if we were to believe this is a burn and not a tattoo, and since he is in no pain, there is not much I can do. Give it some time. I am certain it will fade away on its own. Satisfied, Vank nodded. It was what he wanted to hear. Peridol indicated the boy's infected shoulder. Now that is a burn. I have just the thing for it. This concludes another episode of the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. Thanks for joining me, your host, Benjamin Douglas, for another indie author reading. If you liked what you heard, be sure to visit http colon slash slash thebookspeakspodcast.wordpress.com for more episodes and for links to the author's website and the author's Amazon author page in the show notes. If you'd like to follow me on my own author journey, you can find me at http colon slash slash Benjamin Douglas Books dot wordpress dot com and of course if you're an indie author interested in having your work featured on the show or if you're interested in discussing having your book read and produced by me as an audiobook feel free to contact me at benjamin douglas books at gmail dot com thanks for joining me today i hope you have a productive and enjoyable weekend <laughs>